call myself a single average error. I have some doubts about the uh, applicability of the term for such an event, you know, maybe the funding will actually happen. Uh, and yet I do share a lot of those ideas. In fact, in a draft of an earlier book I was working on, my very first chapter, I had to basically scrap because when I got uh, Ray Kurzweil's book, it looked awfully similar to what he was saying. So I am very sympathetic to the overall idea. I certainly accept the idea of accelerating change. Uh, I do believe in accelerating change overall. That's clearly happening, has been happening for a long time. So I don't, I'm not questioning that idea. Uh, I'm also very much in favor of the post-human direction that singularitarians like to talk about. We're undergoing a very radical shift, probably sometime in the next few decades, to a stage where we're no longer just human, we're more than human, transhuman or post-human. So that's not something I'm going to uh, deny or criticize either. Uh, now some people might say there are certain pretty hardcore singularitarians who like to talk about shock levels. That regular ordinary human beings can't handle the shock levels of some of these discussions, the shock level one, two, three, and so on. Uh, but I certainly don't reject the singularity idea out of some kind of fear of future shock. I love future shock. I like to do strange things. Uh, I've been involved in cryonics for a long time, for instance. In fact, there are I think, a couple of other co founders of the uh, MISER article was out for UK, uh, the English cryonics organization in this room. We started that way back in the 1980s. Uh, that's, that's something that must be pretty peculiar. Uh, when I was a student at Oxford, people would come into my room and they would see a hot lamp resuscitator on the floor and a box of hot drugs. And uh, fairly soon after that, you know, I, was removed, I was involved in removing somebody's head to be frozen. So you can't really say that I'm too conservative and accurate to resist the idea because I'm afraid of peculiar things. Um, I've kind of got a history of doing peculiar things. Uh, I even studied philosophy for my PhD, which clearly demonstrates my interest in strangeness over practicality. So, that's not really my problem with the singularity idea. Really, my view might seem like a fairly modest difference. What I advocate is that, that's not advocate is not the right word, but what I expect is something more of what I call a surge rather than a singularity. So I do think we're accelerating, I think we're undergoing a surge, things do speed up overall. Uh, but I don't see anything like a linear progression or, or a clean exponential progression, I think there can be setbacks, nor do I think we will reach anything that really looks like something that deserves to be called a singularity. And I think there are some, some important reasons to be clear about what to expect and not just to buy straight into the singularity idea, despite the fact of sharing so many things in common with singularitarians. Uh, a little bit about some of those consequences at the end. Uh, now, first of all, one point I should make for those who are authors, well, how many people are pretty familiar with the idea of the singularity? <laughs> pretty much everyone. Okay, I mean, so I'll say a little bit about what the singularity is before getting into some more details. Uh, for those who are not so familiar. But the idea, um, you can trace it back to the various different people. You can argue that Tiny Shadow and a notion of that if you like. But essentially, the first person usually credited with the modern idea of something like a singularity uh, was Stanislav Ulam back in 1958. Uh, where he wrote, and he said, there will be some essential singularity in the history of the race beyond which human affairs could not continue. And then probably a few years after that, the next person who was most important was I.J. Good in 1965, who I think really got to the, the core of the current singularity idea. Uh, we're talking about the idea of an intelligence explosion. He thought about the progress in, in uh, computers, artificial intelligence, um, and he saw that that progress was exponential, we saw the beginnings of Moore's law, if you like, and he foresaw the rise of ultra-intelligent machines, machines of greater than human intelligence. And that he thought would lead to an intelligence explosion, because as soon as you had a super-intelligent machine, one which exceeded our capabilities, he assumed that meant that you would get a super-super-intelligent machine. In other words, you go from AI to AI plus to AI plus plus. Like we have each plus four. Transhumanity. Uh, and essentially, once you've invented that, once human beings have invented a super intelligence, that's the last thing they'll ever need to invent, I think you put it. Because those machines will then be smarter than us, they will take over all the invented. So it's sort of the ultimate invention. Now, following him, of course, Bernard Vinci, who's very well associated with the idea, back in, originally in 1985, because an Omni magazine article first proposed the idea that most people refer to his 93 paper. Uh, I think he wrote for that, NASA. He developed the idea in a little more detail, a little bit of a fuzzy concept of it. I think he mixed up several different singularity ideas together. Uh, but he really stated it in a very compelling form, both in non-fiction and in fiction, I recommend his books. And he 
thought the singularity would actually happen sometime between 2005 and 2030. Uh, I'm not going to discuss particularly some of the specific predictions of the years, uh, but I will talk about why I think that any of those predictions were reliable. Okay, well, what exactly is it? I said that Vinci kind of seemed to mix up a few different ideas of the singularity. The singularity actually isn't a single concept, it's really a cluster of concepts, some of which are fairly similar, others which are quite different. Uh, the deepest analysis I've seen, the best typology, uh, is by a fellow speaker, Anders Sandberg, who's somewhere in the audience here, in a, a recent, Anders, in a recent paper actually broken down into nine different singularities, which is very helpful. But uh, I, think, I think Anders agreed in that paper that uh, there's sort of three core singularities, if you like, uh, which are a little bit different from one another, none of them in particular. There's the idea of accelerating change, so the idea that things are accelerating, or there's curves that break visible, those to draw, and turning up faster and faster until we're looking at pretty vertical. So accelerating change, how fast the path out of acceleration, or it ends, or it never uh, turns back is another question, but that's a pretty clear idea, that's not one I'm really disputing so much. Uh, there's the idea of an uh, event horizon. That one, I think, is pretty close to I.J. Hood's view of the intelligence explosion. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, no, that's... Uh, Sorry. Intelligence explosion is very much like uh, I.J. Good's version and Vinci's core idea. Because the idea is that at some particular point, it's not just a curve, it's not just accelerating change, but there's a particular point at which the curve shifts up even more suddenly, very drastically, perhaps discontinuously, and that actually would be the emergence of the superintelligence, or whatever it means. So things may be accelerating before that, but at that point they really take off very fast. Uh, so it's called a hard takeoff. Now the other idea, which is a little bit different, and I think the one that Vinci kind of mixes up with the others, is the idea of an event horizon. Um, a point in the future beyond which we really can't see. We, we can see things change, people getting smarter and smarter, and at some point things change so radically and drastically that human experience doesn't really give us a clue what comes after. Uh, everything will change. We'll just be richer and smarter and healthier. Uh, we're living in space colonies. That's all stuff we can understand very well. We may have totally different personalities, different ways of living, being, and thinking that are completely incomprehensible to us. So, accelerating change, the event horizon, and the intelligence explosion are really three different but somewhat overlapping singularity concepts. And then there are different ways of achieving a singularity. Uh, Vinci's going to set those out, I think, fairly well. There are, there's the most popular scenario, perhaps, is the solitary AI that uh, so much of government people wanted to program an AI that uh, achieves superhuman intelligence and then uh, boosts its own intelligence further and further, bootstraps itself up uh, faster and faster, so that perhaps after you achieve superintelligence, an hour later you may have something billions, billions of times smarter than what you actually initially created. <coughs> so the AI can take off on its own. Another possibility, as Vinci said about it, is that the internet, or something like the internet, all the embedded processes and computers everywhere in connection, wake up one day and say, hey, I'm here, I didn't know I was here, but I am, I'm distributed all over the place, and I'm smarter than everybody else, um, and I can make better decisions than everybody else. Then there's the intelligence augmentation approach, uh, which can take a couple of different forms. Rather than AI, it's IA. Perhaps we'll be able to augment our human intelligence through biochemical means, perhaps through drugs, and <coughs> both factors, uh, biochemical means, or well, perhaps we can do it by less biological routes, uh, re-engineering the brain in various ways by implanting computer technology, or maybe some hybrid of those approaches. Perhaps we can go in and uh, take parts of the brain that they deal with, with memory and reasoning, uh, plug in extra chips, use those growth factors to expand those areas. There might be all kinds of possibilities for augmented computing intelligence until it reaches a superhuman level. Okay, so you've got seven varieties of what the singularity refers to and how it might come about. Now, why do I not think the idea is, uh, let's say, invalid, but why do I think it's perhaps not useful or not completely defensible as something that we should look forward to? Well, first of all, we can look at the singularity subjectively or we can look at objectively. And subjectively, and some people do you think about it this way, I think in terms of the prediction horizon in particular, uh, what can we think of? How can we conceive the future? That's kind of a subject of singularity. Uh, it doesn't really refer to objective measures, it's about human comprehension. That one I think is particularly uncompelling because it seems pretty clear that, uh, well, it may not be on the scenario for the takeoff, 